Okay. Ian Hancock, absolute pleasure to have you on again, mate. Thank you for stopping in. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what was I going to say to you? Oh, yeah. So, we, mate, you came on like, You came on last time. God, when was that? March time. We did it by Skype, didn't we? The start of the, yeah. the, start of the uh, not the start of the pandemic, but the start of the UK's response to the pandemic, the lockdown. And uh, um, I realised this now. Um, I don't know why. Like, why? Why did? You, why does someone get into microbiology? How did? How did you end up deciding to study it? I've I've always enjoyed biology as a subject. You know, documentaries on the TV when I was a kid, etc. And it was, uh, it was it was an employment route. Um, microbiology is is a is a huge employer. Um, lots of foods are made with microbes. Cheese, beer, my favourite food. Um, fermented foods like pickled cabbage, uh, sausages, etc. So it's a huge turnover industry. But with microbiology, there's all the big industries, pharmaceutical industry with the antibiotics, the um, oil industry, and trying to develop fuels, etc. So it, it was a good career path, the microbiology side of things. Um, obviously, there's a military aspect to it as well, detection and surveillance for pathogens. There's, um, but basically, it was my interest in the biology side of things, and microbiology is just an aspect of biology. Yeah, I got yeah, got yeah. Good. I tried to do something I enjoyed doing. Yeah. So on on that subject, I mean, fast forward now to 2020. Do you, do you regret <laughs> now that you're working in? So you were saying earlier, uh, uh, you you now working with um, in a COVID surveillance lab. Yeah. And you do, and all you're dealing with is positive tests. You did what four thousand? You dealt with four thousand positive tests yesterday. I, I did twenty thousand plus tests overall, but there was four thousand positives in that yesterday. Oh, um, okay. So four thousand positives were, were were there yesterday it, it, from random samples coming in. So it, we're in a highly automated COVID surveillance laboratory, and um, we passed our four millionth test now. So we we uh, being very successful in the amount of work that we're doing. When you say when you say we, do you mean your lab specifically or the our lab UK specifically? Wide? Yeah, four million tests in our lab alone. It's amazing, and the the NHS is testing as fast as they can. And there's, I think, there's five different lighthouse labs that are testing as as rapidly as they can, and it's continuously being scaled up and ramped up, and it, the the response is starting to get um, very efficient, high you know high level automation. So explain the role of the so you got the NHS surveillance that's going on they're yeah. on testing and you got five lighthouse labs are they so they're supplementary to the NHS testing I think right? so yeah they they they're all we're all in the same team all trying to do the testing uh, to try and stop this pandemic so it it's it's a big team effort it's it's like millions and millions of tests everyone has to pull together on this one what's the what's the aim of the surveillance uh Ian? it's to as quickly as possible, tell anyone who's positive to isolate. Um, it, it's it's part of the track and trace system, and the the best way of reducing the R number and the infection rate is to tell people as soon as possible that they are positive and they have to basically self isolate. Um, and also for the correct treatment in hospitals. So, if the earlier the treatment starts for people with COVID, the the greater the survivability chance. Um, so it's, it, it's multi multi purpose, yeah. yeah. But all knowledge is useful in this one. Yeah, absolutely. We, when we were speaking, in, <clears throat> when we spoke in March, um, it was it was a lot of relative unknowns, especially how it's going to impact people. And as time gone on, um, it, it, is it? I mean, to me, it, it seems like it, it predominantly in terms of fatalities, it predominantly impacts the, the older generations. Now, I'm only getting that from the media. From the media. So from your perspective, do you, do, you have, do you have that kind of knowledge on who it's impacting most, who is most susceptible to its worst impact? The, there are risk factors. Age is one of them. Above 50, you get an extra point. Above 60, an extra point on risk factors. But being a man gives you an extra point straight away. Being of an ethnic background, a BAME, gives you an extra point on these risk analysis. Uh, can, can, we just go, can we go back a bit? Yeah. So what was the first one that gives you an extra point before being a man? 
uh, age over 50 a point extra over 60 an extra point so the immunocompromised people obviously they they can't fight off infections very much so that will be cancer patients um some autoimmune diseases um crohn's even something like eczema or psoriasis, any autoimmune could give you a potential extra point on these risk factors. Um, being a man gives you an extra point for some reason. Um, we, we, you, sure they don't know why? Or? There's a lot of research out that, that, like the going joke is man flu, isn't it? The boys get a cold, the girls get a cold, it's nothing to them. And it, it's actually scientifically correct. Uh, man flu does exist, Ebola does exist. And, and we are more susceptible to to these viruses. Well, I, but <clears throat> so I'm trying to understand. I didn't notice. So, I, so I would have put it down when you said. So, with the BAME thing, right now, with the BAME thing is down uh, predominantly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sociological aspects, right? When they when they get the COVID infection, they seem to have a higher rate of fatality. And it's not just an ethnic background issue, and, and it that that's that would influence. The, the spread, the transmission. If you know, if you if you're in an ethnic minority, potentially you can be in a high population density area, etc. You know, they live in big family groups, etc. But we're not talking transmission. Uh, we're talking the actual the fatality rate is higher as well. Being a bame. Ah, right. So, so take away the sociological aspects of why you contracted it. The the percentage they, of that you're a uh, high, regardless of yeah. whether. I mean, because you, I, I, you know, I'm. You you have that sort of in your mind. You have like stereo when you think about high transmission, and you have the stereotype when you think about Indian families, for example. Yep. Uh, you have the stereotypical big families, big lots families. of people living very closely together. That's the culture. Yeah. Um. But you, so ignore that aspect, right? Yep. That's transmission. What you're yep. saying is, regardless of that, being people with being background, generally speaking, are more they, likely to die from it. They've got an extra point on the risk factors, yes. and that's a physiological thing, then. Yes, and they. they are people researching into that? It's it's fact. It's scientific fact. I I don't know why. Um, it, things like this take a lot of research. Mm, I and I've, I've I've been and a lot of people are just focusing on, you know, dealing with this pandemic now and not researching into the aspects of it. Is that a, a question for you? Which you may not know. Is that uh, that is that uh, relative? Is that does that stand for UK only? So being in the UK, or is that being reflected around the world? Around the world. Ah, because uh, right, okay, okay, that is interesting. I didn't know that because what because what the picture that's been painted online, of, of which is yeah, flipping that depends where you look online. Is that it's the the BAME thing is down to sociological factors, you know? Um, yeah, like uh, like you're saying, living in higher risk areas, more susceptible to transmission, so it's more that more BAME get more BAME getting it than non BAME getting it, so they just is more of them dying. Which isn't the case. There's no. physiological factors as well. Yeah, that is a surprise to me. Flipping heck, that is a surprise to me. Um, being, being a man gives you a higher point as well. So, in in, um, in a nine point scale, if you're a man, you get a point extra. If you're over fifty, you get a point extra. If you have any underlying medical conditions, you get a point extra. So, I'm. I'm I'm not. I'm not a bame, so I'm. I'm. I'm a three straight away, even before any other issues. What's the nine point scale? Sorry. It. it you know, we we use a, a point system. So every. So, let's say five, and you can go to work, and you 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 classified as non-vulnerable. At, at six, you're classified as vulnerable, and you've got to self-isolate. Ah, so it's COVID specific. How COVID. vulnerable you are to yeah. COVID. Yeah. Nine point system. Yeah. Six, then you need to stay away from everything. Basically, basically. You, you, you need to shelter. Right. I didn't know about that system. Okay. It, 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 it's trying to simplify it. Mm. So, well, again, on the ma on the male, males have an extra point. I would have put that down to sociological stuff. And, and, and you know, because we're more, I mean, for example, we're more susceptible to death in, in uh, earlier death, aren't we, than, than women, for example. Yeah, um, yes, I think, th aren't we? That uh, could be. I mean, generally speaking, not COVID. I'm not yeah, talking general. Th there's many more women on the planet, even though more males are born because the Y chromosomes are a lot lighter. So they, they, they more b males are born, but there's uh, estrogen's a very protective hormone, and obviously women have more more estrogen than men. 
Men have a little bit, but not much. And and there's a protective effect of that hormone. So what does est- estrogen estrogen do in the body? It, it, it's protective. Um, it, 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 it mainly it controls the females' cycles. It's one of the controlling hormones, but it, it has a protective effect as well. I, d- I don't know the exact science of it. No, it's, um, but, so it's but part of the immune response. Uh, it, it helps with with how tough they are. Oh, I didn't know that. Are you dropping knowledge bombs on me already? I, I wish I knew a bit more about it. Sorry, that's that's the limit of my knowledge no, no, on that no. one. No, it's fine. So, uh, so COVID, being a man is not good. Uh, being BAME is not good. Being old is not good. What else? Any any immune suppression? Oh yeah, yeah. And like as as mild as psoriasis, you were saying. You, anything autoimmune could be could be problematic. I don't know the exact part. You know, I don't know the exact levels, but um, there's, there's a lot of autoimmune problems. Any underlying condition that you don't know about could could have an effect on you. So be everyone should be a little bit careful because you don't know if there's something going on inside if you haven't if you don't feel it. Mm. So. Everyone should be a bit sensible, uh, but people who know they're vulnerable should be sheltering. Mm. Yeah, full, you know, full stop. There should be no difference on that one. Yeah, which brings, I think, which brings, which brings us sweetly, on, nicely on to the reason why we sat here now. I mean, we we um, we're at a point where I, I think was, was it last week, the week, or two weeks ago, I think I message you and I said, you know, I said to you. Because I try and understand what's going on, you know, I I try and understand what's going on with, with the decisions that are being made, the government, in terms of lockdowns and isolation and social distancing and all that, right? Um, I try and understand it because I want to, you know, I want to believe that things are being done for the right reasons in terms of protect people and not ulterior motives, right? And I, I was I got to a point where they talk about second lockdown, and I couldn't. I was looking at the numbers that have been presented on the news in terms of fatality rates and infections going up and and then looking at them, comparing them to when it was back in March and April, going through the roof. And I was struggling to understand it, why we were taking such strict, we were looking at taking such extreme measures again in terms of lockdown, when the numbers didn't seem to be anywhere near what they were in March, April. And then I reached out to you. And I, I feel very privileged, right? Because I um, people get their information from, most information, you have to rely on it from, media from online from searching online and they're invariably exposed to different qualities of information and different um uh different how, how, uh, different valid sort of validations of that information validations basically people get spun a yarn or they don't like they don't know what they're looking at is it if it's accurate or not from people like vi- virus reports to scientific reports to you know um other what other countries are doing and I feel very lucky because I know you, and uh, so you know I'm I, I'm directly in connection with a person who is who is a an actual subject matter expert in viruses and infection control, and so I, I feel like I can I can get the information from the horse's mouth, and that it, and that's why I asked you to come on. Absolutely. So on, on that subject, mate, so th- again, thank you, thank you again for giving me your time. And how how flipping busy you are, right? Um. So on that subject, Ian. Can you explain to me the, the why the lockdown measures have been taken now, which are the same as what they were back, almost the same as what they were back in March, April, when what appears to me is the fatality rate is much less and the infection rate is much, much less than it was then. Can you explain to me why the measures have been taken now? What What is the concern as a virologist around the what the impact of the virus can be now compared to then? What do we know that's changed things? Is um, they they've always known a second wave would arrive come winter time. The, the one of our protective effects of our environment is the UV light in the summer, the long summer days, and it UV is very destructive to viruses, and it it effectively stops transmission of of viruses. Even even ten twenty minutes outside is is. The UV is powerful enough to start to generate the virus. Do, do you know? What's, sorry to interrupt. Do you know what's interesting about that point? So I've known about that for a c- couple of months, but they don't seem to tell people that. I don't understand why that's not communicated in a, in a better way. That UV light basically kills off kills off the virus. 
I don't understand why they wouldn't, why they haven't haven't made that more common it, knowledge. It, it, it's classic winter flu is because at winter time in the environment the, the viruses do not get damaged and it, it's classic to have a have a flu epidemic every winter um it, it's it's the reduction in uv that stops the how can i put it transmission yeah it's it, because because there's less uv out in the in the environment to to transmit to the next person same same with covid um so the, the, it's been expected for a long time um there's a few other things after the lockdown the r rate started to increase a little bit and um a, a lot of people didn't take it too seriously you know you could see all the the news reports with people going straight back into normal life uh, be, before a, vir uh, a suitable vaccines around normal life isn't really around you, people should be protecting others and just being sensible but there was a and eat out to help out as well and things like this it, pe people going back to school and people going back to university and and non-essential jobs and it it did it did increase the transmission after the first lockdown ended. Uh, now with winter here as well, which is a classic time for the viruses to be to spread between people, there was there was an upsurge in the transmission rate, and they put a few areas like Manchester and Liverpool into to strict lockdowns, and following suit, other countries in Europe and the world have had to introduce like a a fire, a fire break, a, a couple of weeks gap to drop the transmission rate down. It, it's down to winter and a little bit of bad behaviour. The, the, the transmission rate's gone up. The two weeks behind the transmission rate rising, you get the you get the um, fatality rate increasing. So there was a couple of days this week, there was like 500 people uh, you know, fatalities, which is which is every one of them is a tragedy. It's so obviously the government's had to step in and do issues, deal with things to sort this out. There's a furlough now till till March. Well, the, well, the or, the, op, the they're keeping the option open. Option March, open until March, which is which is takes stress pressures off people to so they can self isolate if they have to. Um, there's there's they, they are. They're implementing measures, uh, and the, the UK-wide measure now in, um, sorry, uh, England-wide measure, Scotland and obviously Wales are, are doing their own measures, um, but it, it it it's being dealt with as as best as possible, I think. So is it again? So I'm, I think I'm just starting to understand why 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 they're doing what they're doing at the moment in terms of lockdown. Is it because, like I said, the numbers? When I say the numbers, it's just a general term. Fatalities and the transmission rate and uh, and all the rest of it. Now again, they they don't seem it hardly anywhere near what it was in March, April. So now I'm thinking from what you're saying is they're doing what they're doing now with this lockdown because as well as the impact of COVID, because it's getting into winter. All those other illnesses are going to go through the roof as well. So yes. it's an, again an this, NH, overwhelming the NHS side of things. Yes, mm. winter is much worse. Yeah, and and they a lot of preparedness. You know, the the testing system's been ramped up. The the they're working on the the track and trace system to improve it, so it it, it becomes more efficient. Yeah. Expecting this winter to be uh, a problem. Yeah, I was speaking to uh, Jo, who came. I spoke. She's a she at the time I spoke to her was a, an ice a COVID ICU nurse. I don't know. If she, I'm assuming she's still doing the same job. But I, I spoke to her a couple of days ago, and um, she came on the podcast. We talked about it then. Yeah. She, I mean, she is like fragged, just fragged, being being flat out just at, at work, just yeah, you know, really, really, um, just tough. It's just it's just yeah. it's just tough there. Um, what I was going to ask you then? So, I think I understand why they're doing the lock the lockdown now. I think I understand a bit better now. 
Now, question for you. Is there, are there any other countries that stack up in terms of uh, similar to UK uh, in terms of the way the U, like the, the, the way the UK is in terms of demographics and how we are socially and all the rest of it that you as virologists and scientists are able to com- compare to in terms of response and impact because I'm assuming there's a lot of you know a lot of well there is a lot of collaboration going on around the world to try and combat this how is how are countries measuring the the effect of their counter covid measures against one another and see what to see what works and what doesn't what's kind of yeah what's what's the best method for that i think the most successful country was china uh, they had a very long and strict lockdown right at the beginning and their their track and trace system was functional right from scratch but they've had over the years um, good experience and a lot of preparation for epidemics and pandemics uh, because of people living in close proximity to animals in farmland etc and their livestock um, style supermarkets and 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 restaurants etc there's a there's a lot of living closely with sources of viruses and and they they've had a bit more experience at this than everyone else and they they were they were very efficient mm-hmm. at dealing with it i think it's the a highly improved track and trace and and people behaving in a, a responsible manner it's very strict in china yeah 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 it's, it is super yeah it's super strict um I thought of that, but yeah, I thought of that as well when we're talking about these lockdowns, the impact of that, the effect, the impact of them. But what is there, is there a track and trace system similar to ours? Then um, it will be similar now, yeah. And uh, and what we're improving our track and trace system all the time. Yeah, it seems pretty good at the moment, to be honest. I mean, I I, I use it seems pretty well. I think it seems pretty good. I've, I've been told, you know, when it yeah. notifies me when I've been close to somewhere and tells, tells me when I need to isolate or not, not yeah. I've had to isolate yet. But, mm. I've had to isolate the ones so far. Um, but, you know, picked up on the app. Yeah. I, th- I, th- I think it was, um, had teething problems at the beginning as, as, as what happens when you start something new, but it's improving all the time. Yeah. So go, coming back to China, China's lockdown wasn't countrywide though, was it? It was, it was, it was, it was Wutan, was yeah. it? And and a couple of adjacent provinces, right? To Wuhan, I think they locked down. I, I don't know exactly. Um, I, I I've worked in China, and my my old employer phoned me up. He was more worried about me than than that area. I I I work closely with with a, one of the leads in Hanzhou Province, next to Shanghai Province, and they 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 seem to have it nailed down. They knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they had, they had another outbreak, then, didn't they? About four months later, I think five months later, they had to lock down again. The only thing they were worried about then is people coming in with with COVID back into the country from abroad. They they so they they actually dealt with that at the border. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you know, like I say, very organised. They had lots of experience with epidemics over the years, and and yeah, their system has worked. Lots of preparation. Possibly our preparation wasn't as good as it could have been at the beginning of this, not expecting a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but on the uh, on the origin of the of the virus, so there's <clears throat> lots of to and fro in about uh, speculation on. So you know where it came from. Right? It came from Wuhan. And it came from an animal market uh, transmission from a, uh, a bat to a human, um, and then and then the rest is history. Right. Yeah. Now, I've there's a there's a few different things depending on what you read and what you look at but speculating that the it was the virus is man made or altered by man against not um what's do you have any i mean i'm assuming you've done a lot of research on, on the virus obviously yeah. what's um, what's the general consensus amongst the ex- experts at the moment about the origin of it i i don't think there's any clear evidence that it's man made um there's there's information about it I can't see any evidence myself, and nature, and nature causes these things. You know, we had MERS and we had SARS over the last decade, 
Um, we the point mutations create evolution. So let's say one in a thousand mutations is beneficial and gives gives the offspring greater survivability. Um, it this is a constant battle of nature, and I, I think this is natural. Personally, yeah. yeah. Have you have you come across any uh, any opinions amongst experts or evidence that that says to the contrary? Um, no strong evidence that it's man-made, yeah. and it, it's it's a virus that's not really strong enough to affect soldiers in any way. Uh, it's a it's also a respiratory virus that's very slow transmission, as you can see. You know. You have to be in close proximity with someone, and it months and years, and years down the line, it'll still be transmitting. So, so it, to make it for a purpose is there's no point to it. Mm. There's no there's no benefit to this. So, but these things do happen in nature. It's it's a, it's a common occurrence for point mutations for evolution. It happens all the time. Yeah, one of the, one of those one of the theories going around. Uh, about it being man-made is that China did it to China did it to destroy the Western economy, the American economy, and and thus gain for it themselves. But the way I look at that is, man, it it, it would be if you release some, something like this into the world, it would be virtually impossible to protect yourself against it as a country. Yeah. You know, and I mean, but the counter to that, I suppose, is they have managed to do that. They've they've been impacted much less than everyone else. Um, but again. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be just one of those. It's a bit, it's a bit bloody far fetched to be able. To, you just can't, you know, sit, unless it's sitting on a vaccine. We've been, we've been expecting a pandemic because you know, microbiologists and virologists have been expecting a pandemic, a serious one, for for sixty odd years now. Um, the COVID is not the same level as a pandemic type flu, which potentially could kill thirty to fifty million, and there should be a lot of measures in place. And a lot of PPE stored in warehouses and kit available, and um, to a certain extent, we're lucky. It's only a, a COVID level virus. It, 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 you could consider this one as a serious as it is. You could consider this one good community training exercises to to get people used to it. So, explain the comparison you draw on the flu there, please. COVID is is much less virulent than than a pandemic flu would be. We, we're expecting the pandemic flu at some point, which because it's overdue many many years, uh, that's potentially able to kill thirty to fifty million people. So when you say virulent, so explain what virulent means. Uh, uh, how pathogenic it is. Oh, okay. So so COVID then relative to flu is is not as bad as the flu. On like a, 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 a new type of flu. A, a novel flu would would kill between thirty and fifty million people. That's the estimates, which would be far far worse than COVID. And that's what we've been expecting for many many years. That the last there was a big flu, if you remember, the Spanish flu in nineteen eighteen, and then there's another big flu in nineteen fifty two. And there's there's you know, good healthcare measures, good NHS. We've had no major outbreaks of flu since nineteen fifty two, and. And you expect them every thirty years as a scientist, and it's been over sixty years now. So, the, you know the the upside of this is um, lots of training, lots of community resilience training, and and it, it could it could long term it could it could be really a benefit to everyone to learn from this. Yeah. So so just going back. Right, so the, so the COVID isn't as isn't as uh, bad as the flu, but that's. And because that, is, that no, is an argument that gets thrown up. Yeah. Normal winter flu, and co because COVID is novel, it, it's it's very dangerous. Our bodies and COVID haven't adapted together yet. We a lot of asymptomatic carriers are spreading it everywhere um, without knowing. You know, it's 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 quite a tricky one. Winter flu is is a very dangerous disease, but the, a, a, an expected pandemic flu of a novel new type of flu uh, that would that would be much much worse. So yeah, so I'm trying. So I'm just trying to understand this in my head. So going yep. back, it's, in terms of like uh, how how bad COVID is to health wise, 
to a person. It's not as bad as flu, right? But and that's what people look at in an isolated way to to you know. It's, I mean, a lot of people have been impacted in a really bad way, but but financially, right? Obviously, yeah. oh yeah, totally. and emotionally, right? Financially, yeah. emotionally, it's an absolute nightmare, um, and uh, and and a lot of frustration there. And, they, and they're looking at this, and I do sometimes as well when I'm trying to trying to work, understand what's going on. And I think well, it's not as bad as the flu. Now I'm try, I think I'm seeing the bigger picture now, and maybe the case it's not. So I'm I'm just I'm speaking out loud and correct me if I'm wrong. No, it's not as bad as the flu in terms of health wise. But it is bad nonetheless. And when you, what we're talking about is the impact of COVID, when you slot in COVID as a new additional thing that's going to cause people ill health and hospitalise them, right? You slot that in, it's adding the strain onto the NHS, which means that the, uh, the, 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 what's the word? The combined impact across just people's health across the board, um, it's a worse impact because more people die because everything, not just COVID, but the NHS is overstretched. And so everything doesn't get the care it needs. Yep. Every from, I mean, cancer being a prime example, yep. right? Cancer treatment has been put back. You yep. talk about the flu coming. So it's the impact that COVID has on our ability to treat people for yep. anything, yep. for anything. That, that's the concern. Am I, am I summarizing that right, Ian? Yes. There's, there's um, big, so for, a, a big problem is poverty and the, economy being effectively closed down during lockdowns is 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 causing a lot of ill health mental ill health and physical ill health uh, but poverty is the biggest issue here with poor diets poor housing overcrowding um, as poverty increases you'll get more illness more disease so hypothetically then right so and this is completely hypothetical because the, yeah. the world doesn't work like this completely hypothetical if we had a, a healthcare service that was i don't know three times the capability of our healthcare service now, right? The capability, which isn't, we just never have it, but three times. It's got 200% extra capacity, right? Yep. You've got half of all the hospitals are empty, right? We would not be treating COVID as seriously as we are now, right? Because we, with the, our healthcare service will be able to cope with the extra numbers because we just happen to have loads of spare room. That, right? That, that, again, hypothetical. And I'm not saying the health, the health, that the NHS should be two or three times the size it is now just trying to again understand the concern around covid rel uh, relative to everything else hindsight will 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 say if it's the covid measures of protecting us from covid um if if they've been of benefit compared to the amount of additional deaths from cancers and and other illnesses and the lack of lack of other types of healthcare and and mental illness, but that's that's hindsight. At the at the beginning, the additional hospital beds were were created in the Nightingale hospitals. That in in the end, a few were used, not not as many as they needed. But hindsight is is a is is so powerful. They 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 implemented a, a, a lots of additional hospital beds at the time. And they weren't needed in the end. No, I'm good. And I've had that conversation with people. You yeah. Know, saying it's again, COVID. Uh, it doesn't. It's not as bad as what people make out. Look, they didn't use hospitals, but better to have the hospitals and not use them than not have the hospitals and need yes. them. I mean, going back, I just want to rephrase what I was trying to say there in terms of the NHS being three times as big. And uh, I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to. You know, it's. I think you know, the 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 healthcare service in any country. The healthcare service is only as big as it needs to be based on what the, the threats are, yeah. right? Because money. <laughs> yeah, money. Because yeah. money. That's it. Uh, right? it. To to pay for empty hospitals isn't very clever. So you can just you can just make up another Nightingale hospital as and when it's required. Yeah. So we got so each every country's got a healthcare service only as big as what's needed because money, yeah. and because politics and because flipping everything else. When you introduce a new thing in that is gonna put a big burden on healthcare, like COVID, for example, and granted. Again, you know, you said it's not as it's not as dangerous as the flu, in in on its own individually. But when you're adding it in to the existing sort of environment, it is a big danger on the impact as everything else. COVID works often with flu or with pneumonia, so the it the treatments are becoming better though. Um, the they're treating for organ failure. From COVID now, so treatments and, and the vaccines becoming available. Um, 
So uh, there are a lot of positive things in the near future. Yeah, we'll come on. We we'll want to come on to the vaccine in a bit. Actually. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> not right now. We'll come on in a bit. But question for you on uh, on you talk about influenza. We talk yep. about the, this, and I've noticed it myself. I remember um, I was looking at on at the NHS um, website to see like when you should go and get a test. Yep. And it's and I think it was saying at the time if you got a a, a repeated const, constant cough for an hour or a cough that repeats regularly over twenty four hours or you've got dizziness or, I can't remember the symptoms but I was thinking flip a neck they're really loose man that yep. could be anything that could be a hangover right yeah that could be I had too many cigarettes yesterday if you're a smoker yep. right now is there a risk that um, that people uh, who are dying from COVID nineteen that they have been misdiagnosed. So someone who dies and hasn't been tested, for example, before they die, is there a risk that, and again, this has been speculated online, everywhere, especially amongst the conspiracy theorists, that COVID-19 has been put onto death certificates incorrectly uh, or falsely in order to, I mean, the, the people say it's to inflate the numbers, but on a hospital level, it would be to try and get more, more, more money and more budget allocated because of the risk. Is there a risk that COVID-19 has been misdiagnosed especially amongst the fatalities it, it's it's effectively random testing so you you do a swab and the, the testing centers would wouldn't have an idea who the person is uh, it'd be barcoded so every all the tests would be either you know positive or negative and they would just be assigned to the patient so there could there, there could be no bias it's it's randomized so that, oh right so let's go to the mechanics of this because of the Mis, way it's mr mr or mrs smith we don't. Nobody knows. It's yeah. Just so Mr. Or, yeah. So Mr. or Mrs. Smith dies right in hospital. Yeah. Um. They've gone in there. Maybe they. Maybe they've had. I don't know. Maybe they. I don't. They, they died of something. Um. Ah. Yeah, so they die of something. They get swabbed. Yeah. The swab goes off to a lab. Lab doesn't know who it was or even if they're alive or dead. Right. Yeah. And then lab does a test, sends it back to the hospital. Yeah. This patient who they don't know is dead or alive. Yeah. Uh, is is positive or negative? Right. Yeah. Okay, I understand that. That makes complete sense. Now, a question for you. Um, you may not know the answer to this, actually. Does the, if someone's got COVID and they die of a heart attack, for example, you, you may not know this. Does the fact they have COVID become the, 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 the reason for death on the certificate or does it go down as a heart attack? You may not know this, but I'm asking Yeah, I, I don't know that one. I'll um, have to find that one out. But, but they are they are saying had covid they're not saying died of covid um because you could die of something else they, red they, herrings happen in medicine all the time they are making the distinction yeah uh okay i we, we'll have to look into that after yeah it's fine if you don't know because and the reason i ask again is is um is this this sort of fear-mongering allegations that get thrown around and if someone has covid and it goes down onto the statistic of people who died from covid against people who died with COVID. There's a, there's a difference, right? It's interesting. We'll have to have a look at that. Yeah, I'll have to have a look at that. It's qu quite complicated because of the, the link with influenza and pneumonia as well. Uh, yes, good point. Mm. But I think COVID is going to be an aggravating factor anyway, right? Yes. So if you got COVID, then yeah, okay, yeah. I see. All right, yeah. Yeah, it is. But the, I mean, just going back. So people who die, they're getting tested. It's not... People, someone doesn't get COVID, put on their flipping medical records if they weren't tested. It, you can't. It's not done. Well, in the, it's not done an assumption, right? Yeah. Or, most most people now would be tested uh, to to give them the correct treatment. It'd be as soon as soon as they're in hospital, I'm sure they're tested. Mm -hmm. And I I think to get into places nowadays, they have to be tested. Yeah. Um, tested beforehand. So should we should we uh should we go on to the vaccine? Go on then. What you tell me, what do you know what do you know about the vaccine? So all I know is what I've seen on, on the news. Um we seem to be quite close to a vaccine. It seems to be super accelerated, mind. Yes. Uh, in terms of the way they're going about things, however, it's been tested on like forty thousand people so far. Um the side effects include something like really bad vomiting and really bad migraines I've read for people who have the vaccine. And that's for maybe a week, a couple of weeks when they have it. Um I'm gonna stop there because Wait, I'm Google. Google isn't knowledge. Yeah, you are in this case. <laughs> okay. Um, vaccine trials are normally four phases. They, they ramp up numbers and they ramp up. Um, I 
right, they're looking for different things at the different s stages. Um, we this Christmas is the one of the final December, one of the final phases for, and like you say, forty thousand people will be tested for, for any adverse effects. The, the class, the, one of the worst is the anaphylactic shock to something being introduced to your body and you're highly allergic. So any vaccine, polio vaccine or or measles vaccine, every vaccine has a risk associated with it. Um, it's a it's a very successful vaccine, a ninety percent success rate, um, and that's probably due to the the virus not mutating as much as it was expected to do so. So it's very positive. There's there's a few different vaccines available in the world, and I I can. <laughs> Normally, there are over several years the vaccine trials before given to the general population, and they they look for any side effects whatsoever. Um, if you remember, you know, back to our youth, uh, with a very sad issue of the thalidomide drug that was given to pregnant women, and say that again, sorry. That there was a very sad issue with like the thalidomide drug that was given to pregnant women. It was for morning sickness, and there was teratogenic effects to the babies. Uh, they, they, they do so much exhaustive testing now because they don't want anything like that to happen. So they can't rush things through super fast. But they obviously there's a risk benefit here. They, they if they get it through a little bit faster, they can save lives. Uh, but the ninety percent success rate will if, if they use these vaccines wide, wisely. There's like a, a shield around a a high area, and then vulnerables etc and then to the general population it, it can I, I think it will be the end of it, it I, I think this vac these vaccines could be very successful really yeah v very very good news because of the because of the, basically because of the lack of uh, mutations in the in the covid virus it it's not mutating anywhere near as much as was feared what um why is that so why in the first place why do they fear it to why would they think it's going to mutate a lot because th that's what rna viruses do they when when they re replicate there's there's no proofreading mechanism with rna uh, whereas dna viruses have a proofreading mechanism and and the rna viruses always always mutate a bit more but it, this one is is actually mutating at a low level so it there shouldn't be too many different serotypes or strains so it should be, it should be quite a successful vaccine, and there's a few that are on the market, and obviously, again, hindsight will be the, you know, a brilliant thing. But I, after after successful safety trials, I, I I'll have no problem taking the vaccine. Okay, uh, yeah. I, I I'm I'm really looking forward to going back to a normal life. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say there's a few on the market, you mean there's a few and there's a few and and uh, in development, trial, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the closest one is that this Pfizer, 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 Pfizer. Yeah. Pfizer. Pfizer. So where, where where was this one developed? Or not developed? Well, yeah, yeah, developed. Yeah, where was this? Where is this one? Where's it come from? As in the lab? Where is the lab? Is okay. it is it the states? I I I don't know where this one's being developed. You're yeah, one of the wilder. Uh, I, I would imagine in lots of different places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a lot of work. One of the wilder conspiracy theories going around, and uh, I hate come on, them, but they uh, they make me think about stuff because I absolutely believe in conspiracies. Yeah, but I don't believe everything's a flipping conspiracy, right? And a conspiracy is just a hidden plan, okay? <laughs> but one of the wider one, wilder ones going around is that this is a conspiracy to get people mass immunized, mass <clears throat> mass immunized, the world immunized for in inverted commas population control control of people. Now, I don't see how that can work from a, from a virus flipping, a virus vaccine perspective, and I don't want to go down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole. But I can't imagine you can't. There's you can from a, from a vaccine being developed to, for viruses that how how that could have a psychological control impact. Uh, I can't I can't understand how that could work either. <laughs> I'm sorry for bringing it up. Yeah. Mate. No, it's, it's it, there's so much contradictory evidence on the on the social media. It's it, people have stopped looking now, haven't they? they? It's just it's just too difficult to. Uh, it's to... the joys of the internet, mate. The information age, the the, the 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 information age has become a find the needle in the haystack, and the needle in the haystack is the real info. The the making it a criminal offence to give false information about the vaccines, to to stop to stop. Um... 
all this contradictory evidence. But there's an issue with that, though, right? There's an issue with that because because mm. knowingly giving false information that that's, that's different. Right? Yeah, knowingly giving false information that should be a criminal yeah. offence. But the problem is that like who's going to decide that? Like, is it don't the social media decide? Like Twitter, Facebook decide. Um, like the police to decide because how do they decide what's real information it, it, or not where they're getting it from it'll be the legal system that decides mm. if it's if it's knowingly or accidentally I mean that's half of Facebook getting arrested yeah that's half of Twitter I know I, 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 that's half of my friends <laughs> in in America just for ordinary vaccines the a few cities have had to send tens of thousands of, of students home uh, because of no vaccines they, they they need a vaccine record to go to into the school system now, and I could see that coming into other countries. Say that again. Say that again. Sorry. Um, some of the big cities in America have have, have basically um, have ex- excluded non vaccinated children, and it, at high levels thirty and forty thousand, uh, and they weren't allowed back into the school system until they had their vaccination certificates. But, but what back? What normal vaccination? For children's mean? vaccines, yeah. There's so many anti-vaxxers uh, that, that it became dangerous for the people who had vaccines even. Because uh, vaccines are only like 90% or... So if you've had your vaccines and you're part of the herd immunity to protect others, you, it, it's not fair on, on you if, if a load of people around you have, have, have not even had their vaccines. Yeah. So to to get like sixty, seventy, eighty percent people va- vaccinated to get herd immunity, um, they 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 had to implement strict measures. See, I didn't. I mean, I didn't realize it was that big an issue over there. Now, I know about the anti-vaxxer movement, like I, what well, the movement. I, I'm gonna call it a fucking movement. Part of my language. Yeah. Anti-vaxxer opinion. They, they, for me, they sit in the same box as flipping flat earthers, right? Um, I didn't know it was that big. Like tens of thousands of of kids who parents or they are anti-vaxxers and don't get the vaccinations. It's a good point though about the impact it has on people who are pro-vaccination. So, you know, the legal system of you know countries follows the legal system of other countries and they, I, can, I can see that coming in. So kids not being admitted to schools unless they've had the vaccinations? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, but the conspiracy theories are going to love that. They're going to love it. They're going to love it. Mm. So, but you mentioned herd immunity. Okay. Yeah. Now, one of the, the repeated things that's been coming up since the start of the pandemic, since we last spoke, okay, yeah. is let's get this is an easy solution to this. Yeah. Let's just let everyone get sick. Sh- and I said this myself, actually. I, I'll be honest. I said this about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, when I was getting very frustrated. And I said it online. I said we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. We should be. We should just isolate the vulnerable. Let everyone else just get on with it and get sick if they're going to get sick. Right. Yeah. Now, after this conversation, now I'm beginning to think I'm a bit of a moron. Right. Which, which is a regular occurrence for me. So, talk to me about herd immunity, okay? What is the problem? I know, I think I know the answer. But I do know the answer, but we'll leave you explain it. The problem, if we had gone down the road of, okay, let's not bother doing anything. Let's shelter the vulnerable, isolate the vulnerable, everyone else go about it, and let's, like, let's let herd immunity take place, and we'll be sorted in a matter of months. What's the issue with that solution? The... A lot of people who consider themselves to be non-vulnerable could have underlying conditions and they could hurt themselves. Uh, we're talking over a, a country with millions of people. We, we're talking, you know, again, a high rate of incidence. Um, hindsight is the only thing that will tell everyone for sure if, if that would have been the better route. Um, it could, the government could have decided to go that route and just pre- sheltered the vulnerable. It would have been the it would have been the, the health service impact again, though, uh, wouldn't it? I think because you would have that overwhelming yes presence you'd, of people who are it. sick going to into health yeah. in the NHS in the hospitals, and then everybody else who's sick with all the normal stuff doubling up. Yeah, um, so. The incidence of all the other illnesses, cancers, and all the other problems would have gone up, and and like I say, it's a very difficult question. That one, um, hindsight will tell us. It's still, it's still wave two. Are there any? Uh, are there other country? Any countries that um, 
uh, that you know of where we've taken some al- uh, like alternative methods of approach to to us uh, to the um, to dealing with the virus, and I've had and I've had unusually successful or surprisingly successful results. Um, and now, what, I mean, what, one one country that people reference is Sweden, as in because they didn't lock down, but they they're misinformed on that. So, so, so Sweden did lock down, right? It just it just wasn't called a lockdown. Um, because they, they, people look at and people look at that and think, oh, Sweden didn't lock down, and they, yep. uh, but and they were fine. Well, no, they did. What yep. happened was what happened with Sweden? Because I looked at this. What happened with Sweden was in their constitution, the Swedish government are not allowed to implement things like a lockdown on the public. It comes from like the World War times. Yep. They're not allowed to do it. They can't suppress things like that. But the Swedish government turned around and said, "This is what we need to do." This is what we suggest you do. You need to social distance. You need to stop doing essential work. You need to stop doing X, Y, and Z, or else we're going to be in a world of pain. And people voluntarily yeah. took the measures, the same measures that we took in terms of lockdown. Yeah. They stayed away from restaurants and bars. They only did critical work, only critical employment. You had the key worker thing. Yeah. But in, instead of it being a uh, like law decreed thing by the government, it was strongly advised by the government and, and the people listened. Yeah. A very wealthy country. Um, good education, excellent healthcare. Um, let's say pro- poverty is the probably the biggest problem associated and, and linked to COVID. So it's, it's poor people suffer the most in 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 every country. And that's, uh, uh, that's poor diets, overcrowding, yeah. stress, and all the other factors. Uh, and Sweden doesn't have any of those issues. It's a it's a. I've not been there. I'd like to go there, but. Um, it gives me the impression that the North Scandinavian countries are, are um, economically very, very strong. Japan also nailed it as well, didn't they? Japan did it, re- and New Zealand, they did it really well. So what, what did they do? Um, again, Japan's very strict. So if, if the people are advised to do something, they'll do it. And they're super healthy as well, right? Super, super healthy, um, experienced in using face masks. But we, we all use face masks quite late. Um, I think... New Zealand had an excellent track and trace system. I know people who were working on it, and they were they were very happy to 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 track everyone down, trace it. I, I think that's that's the key for all countries is the the test the trace system has to be really nailed down. Um, yeah, I think that that's the way forward. So, um, like I said, I said, yeah, I, I spoke to my Patreon supporters yesterday yep. and said, look, got Ebola, Ian, can I back on? And, um, and you know, they, obviously they, they're my avid, most keenest supporters and they, they listened to the last podcast with you on. And uh, again, we are, well, I got you on, we're, we're down the line now. So I, I asked them if they had any questions for you. So I'm going to go do it. I think we've answered some of it, right? I'm going to go through the, some of these questions, if that's all right. Okay. So uh, here's one from, uh, I think this was from Dave Davis. Um, we'll, I think we might have answered this slightly already. We'll go around. So question one, how extensively has the vaccine been tested? And have there been any long-term health negatives identified if the vaccine is taken? It's very successful so far um there's always negatives with vaccines because you can have an allergic reaction with them um the, the mathematicians who work out the, from the clinical trials they'll make sure that the absolute minimal negative effects compared to the benefits um, they wouldn't let you take them if, if if the risk of the vaccine was worse than the covid they wouldn't let you take them so again it's, it's risk analysis and mathematics Okay. It's a no-brainer. You have to. If they say take them, you should take them. If yeah. they say don't take them, you don't take them. Okay. But only listen to the government scientists. Uh, don't listen to internet and social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. With you. There's there's a risk with every vaccine for everyone, and um, but it's it's minute. It, there's a risk crossing the road, and you have to live. So it, sometimes you have to accept a little risk. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, d- um. What is this is Dave again? So, what is your take on the handling of everything by the government or foreign governments? And do you believe that lockdowns work and are effective? The the lockdowns did bring the our number down to under one. 
Um, it's it's probably the strongest measure that we can use in the arsenal. Um, the, it, they 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 have been effective, and the 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 two week fire break in Wales has worked as well as dropped the numbers quite a lot. Um, the, the the best evidence for a for a lockdown though is um, the pandemic flu in nineteen eighteen. Australia didn't allow ships to dock uh, for six weeks after sh- sailing to the, to the area, and they didn't get any pandemic flu in Australia, save tens of thousands of lives. And um, it's like it's 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 proven to to work. It works. Okay. Good. Right. I was trying to pull up. There are some cracking questions, John. So uh, I can't remember where this is from. I think it's from Tom Turner. One second, let me pull it up. But is there any risk? Sorry, so day, day, day. Oh no, sorry. Back we. we oh, those questions are from Tom. Those questions were from Tom Turner. Sorry. Right. So one more from Tom. Right. Um, after the initial outbreak in uh, China at the end of last year, and the start of this one, their infection numbers dropped and have stayed lower than many other countries. Why is that? Now I think we sort of answered this. Or you yeah. did. So they're, they're stricter over there, and they, they 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 used to face masks and lots of measures to. To prevent illness, and they had a track and trace system already in existence, did they? Yeah, they they experienced dealing with epidemics. Okay, cool. Okay, um, right. Uh, this is a question from from Mark Walker. A fucking great question. So I swore again. Uh, what are the risks of a country or a terrorist group creating or weaponizing a virus that only targets certain genetic markers? Ooh. Yeah, it's a, the. It's this is a quite a heavy question, as you can imagine. There was many terrorist training camps in Afghanistan before all you guys went in there, and successfully. They, it's very difficult to prove a negative, but the, the the amount of terrorist attacks I've witnessed over the over the world, you know, reading the newspapers, etc., has, has been very very low the last few years, and I, I think the military. Uh, do a good job in keeping the terrorist groups down. Uh, it's been a very difficult time for the, all the military, but that's that's a big part of all the military's jobs. And 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 th- that, but like I said, I can't say anything other than the, the lack of terrorist attacks has been the best evidence there is. Yeah. But I mean, from a scientific perspective. Is is uh, I take it, it is possible to create a virus that would target certain genetic markers. So if someone wanted, wanted to wipe out all the gingers on Earth, now I wouldn't want that to happen because I'm ginger yeah. myself. Yeah. But it would be possible, hypothetically, to create a virus that target the ginger gene. It, there, there's there's technology there now, but you couldn't. But antibodies are manufactured in your body randomly, and and you would always get a. a a group of survivors, you'd always get quite a high percentage of survivors. Even in the worst case scenario, it'd be ten percent still alive. But because they would just be randomly immune to it. Randomly immune, yeah. Uh, so you can't. And, and respiratory viruses are not are not a good weapon. You know they come in because they take so long. Uh, and every country has a has a reporting system for diseases, so it would be known about quickly and dealt with. But there's there's lots and lots of institutions that deal with these things, um, and also terrorist groups would need a lot of expertise and equipment, and it would be easy to 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 know if, if somebody was trying anything like that, and and I'm, I'm sure lots of special forces in the country, they they in their role and in anti terrorism is to make sure anything like this doesn't happen. So it's specifically be people's jobs to stop this. Mm. What about um, just talking about genetic markers? Gone off, going, not gone off. We're on topic. Gone off, not gone off topic. Not gone off topic. So we're on. Confuse myself. Too much coffee. Just on that. Um, am I right in saying? So I read somewhere in a document. It was a documentary, BBC documentary, and uh, that all of people of European descent. Yeah. Okay. We all have. Uh, we have a gene or a part of our DNA which are all linked back to one individual, one woman who is known as Europa. Yeah. And, and Are you aware of that? Um, we're all from Africa. The, the route we took out of Africa yeah. 
and you can you can see Europa was obviously from Africa, yeah. but I mean, yeah, yeah, go on, go on. We, so we we all have a certain amount of genes from Africa, um, and they mutated along the way. Point mutations, you know, light skin, dark skin, depending on what country you ended in, and um, there is a lot of a gene mixing as well. So. Thinking about it, you it, be, it would be quite difficult to actually take out a race of people because of lots of gene mixing. Mm. Um, okay, we'll leave it at that. I don't, yeah. I don't want you to think about it more, just in case yeah. you go a bit loopy and start. Yeah, that's right. Whatever. That's a <laughs> difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, next, I think so. You got a couple from Dave Davis. Obviously, Dave Davis yeah. also of React Disaster Response. Yep. Yeah. Um, his first question, we we did we did answer it, but it was an interesting answer what you gave. So, uh, what's your take on the reports of minority groups being disproportionately affected? Now, when you answered that earlier about the BAME groups, what really surprised me is when you were saying there is a physiological, there is a physiological reason and, and social that, social reasons, yeah. Uh, so we know about, we know about the social ones. Yeah, there is a physio physiological reason yeah. which really surprised me. Yeah, that's, I, mean, I hope they find that out because that's not great for BAME. No, you know, not at all. Um, yeah. So, so just it's on that, how much more likely are they to? Um, how, I mean, you said it's a in, in, it's a risk factor of w one extra if uh, on that scale if you're being. But the percentages, like how much more likely are you to die? Or just over ten percent extra. Jesus, it's it's an extra point on that risk analysis scale. I was telling you. So out of nine, an extra point is like another ten percent. Ten percent risk addition. Okay. Yeah, my my colleague Dr. Matuidi from Zimbabwe died in March. Oh no! Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, and my my colleagues who are you know baby and orange, you know, I've, I've I've said to them, you know, I, I don't know why you're in, you know, because we were back in back in the uh, work, and uh, they they because it, it does increase significantly the risk factors. Flipping out. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, second question from Dave was uh, so with the vac with the vaccines being politicised and richer countries buying their way at the front of the queue. Uh, what can be done to ensure that poorer countries get access to the vaccines? That's been a big problem uh, with the start of this pandemic. The lack of preparation and store of basic equipment and PPE. That it should be in store for every country because when the pandemic started, the whole world wanted certain pieces of things and it's only the wealthy countries that could get them. Um, that, that that needs to be put into legislation. Um, I don't know, because it is a commodity and supply and demand. It's a very difficult one, but I think legislation and the policymakers have to have a, a long think about it. And vulnerable strictly first. And then people in areas around high, high area, you know, high concentrations, and then to everyone else. It, they could, it could be brought out as part of the uh, clinical trials to yeah. to make sure the poorer countries get a fair fair shout. Um, okay, so we got I think we got two more, right? So this one is from Alan Rankin. Alan Rankin, um, is anyone doing research into uh, finding out why some people are asymptomatic while other people are flawed with it? They are, yeah, they, they're just in, they're in bed or hospitalised or die, right? I is there anything is there anything genetic to explain it other than the obvious old or underlying health thing, and uh, would that help with research into better vaccines? The all, all information is useful for development of vaccines. So no, all, there's no insignificant knowledge. It's very important. The, 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 a key problem with this virus is is how many asymptomatic carriers there are. Um, it the the transmission is is very very high and airborne as well it's very very high it's like a perfect storm for transmitting of a virus the the vaccine would would likely stop somebody being a reservoir so that even asymptomatic people wouldn't Transmit it. Yeah, it, yeah, it'd, yeah, be, yeah. it'd be useful. The the um, there's less carriers. Less carriers. More people vaccinated. Less carriers. Right, that's okay. it. Um, with 
with these viruses, especially the novel ones, uh, you, you get a you get a situation where you, you, the person doesn't notice it's it's in them. It, it, like I say, they've got it, but no symptoms whatsoever, no standard cold symptoms or headaches or anything. But you you, you get a cytokine burst. You get a, you get a, the, the the killer can be the the body doing a huge overreaction to the virus. So it's the strength of somebody's immune system that actually kills them, and not the actual virus. What, sorry, what cytokine? Cytokine burst. It's a part of the immune response to any foreign invader in your body. It's a, and you, you just have a huge inflammatory reaction. What is it? A hormone or? Um, it, it, there's there's a, it, 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 it's massive. Uh, it's it's the whole immune system working. Uh, together, there's there's like a cascade of chemicals and hormones and and reagents, etc. And it's 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 a it's like a massive overreaction to a foreign invader. And lots of research going into it. Okay. It, you know, high level, very difficult research. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say a vaccine would stop this occurring because you'd have a suitable immune system, and it'd be appropriate. So, so just going back to so the, the question was, yeah, the question was, um, is there any more understanding about why some why some people are, uh, why some people are asymptomatic and others get absolutely hammered by it? Why is there a variation? Why people get? Because I mean, I've you know, I've I've read about I've read and I've heard about people who are really fit, really healthy, yep. and they're not in like a vulnerable age group. No. They're not a vulnerable demographic. I mean, we're talking like you know, white, you know, young. Athletes, yeah. Yeah. as an example, it, and they get absolutely destroyed by. It's by a virus. it's an inappropriate immune response to the to the invader. It, their their body is 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 hyperactive, and in, their immune system it damages. It's so intense it damages themselves. It's it's not really the virus that damages them. It's, See, it's, you it, can be too healthy. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Be as healthy as you can be, you know, ex- exercise and eat a good diet and have enough sleep and everything. All these things help de- yeah, yeah. with any defenders, all the common sense things. Um, yeah, I mean, drink- I, I, thought, I was joking when I said that. You can be yeah. too healthy. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm an extremist with stuff. Yeah. 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 But there is a lot of research onto it, but I, I, I'm not up to date with that research. No, it's fine. Um, so two more questions. So this is from my good mate, Steve Llewellyn, who is down the conspiracy rabbit hole of yes. everything. Okay. Everything. Our, so it's... He's a good guy, right? Highly intelligent guy yeah. as well. So his question is, and it's a really good question. Um, what I mean, we, we, you and I are both wearing masks now, obviously, yeah. because uh, because the, the, the because that's what we need to do according to what the government says, and also the fact that I mean, with social distancing as well, mind. Yeah. But also the fact that you're working around a lot of positive deaths, and you don't yeah. want to give any lurgy to me. Yeah. Um, negative health impacts of the mask. He is asking. So Steve is asking specifically. He said, surely that you cannot, you must be getting less oxygen into the body than than you need, and so the masks must have a negative health impact on wearing them. Now, I I don't I, I don't think so, but yeah. I don't know, so I'm asking you. Yeah, the masks the, on his the, behalf. They they're a filter, but they they allow air straight in and out. The you, when you breathe in air, it's twenty percent oxygen. You breathe out sixteen percent oxygen. And four percent carbon dioxide. You know your body converts it. You you always have a, a good volume of residual air in your lungs. You can't fully flatten your lungs. Um, so you, it's it's always like a diffusion shell of of the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen. How do I say that? It's it's like a leaky radiator. It it's never totally empty because you're topping it up. And and the mass in, totally insignificant into into the, the oxygen levels because because you, you you breathe out excess oxygen but CPR wouldn't work if you had problems there's the air you breathe out is also fresh enough to give life to somebody else so the masks don't have any negative health impact one way or another so possibly people who have an autoimmune issue like eczema or psoriasis could get an inf- inflammation around the around the face and Maybe an infection, then that that wouldn't be very nice at all. But, but from a so, respiratory point of view, respiratory, no, you get no oxygen issues. Yeah, no. 
it's somebody who would have problems with their lips and face because of a mask. They sh they're vulnerable anyway. They shouldn't be out. They shouldn't be wearing the mask. They should be sheltering. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, last one. And uh, this, so this is my daughter raised this point, but she okay. didn't know I was going to be speaking to you when okay. we were just having a conversation. And uh, she was talking, I mean, she's in school, right? And she was, uh, she was really interested in these days about social media. It's so different to when we were kids. Man, my kids are so aware of politics and government and all that, especially now, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you got like an 11 year old with an opinion on uh, politics. When I was 11, I didn't care about any of that, but it's good and it's bad, right? I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I wish I got exposed to it at that early age. You sort of, they're gonna, what, they're, kids are gonna be a lot wiser, a lot more understanding about how the world works when they get older than, than I, I was, you know, I, I think, just, just because of that information, right? Now, my daughter's going to school. She, um, my youngest daughter, I should say, she had a concern about, um, she's basically saying, right, why are we being sent into school? Do they not know, they've been the government, that the virus still gets transmitted in schools. So in terms of infection control, Ian, which yeah. I know you're an expert in as yeah. well, right? I hope you don't mind me. Describe you as an expert. Yeah. You, I think you're an expert, right? In terms of infection control, we're taking all these measures, lockdowns, fire breaks, etc. Schools have been allowed to go on. Children are less vulnerable to the virus than other people, but they are still, they're just as susceptible to being a carrier as anybody, as an adult, right? Yeah. So, can you can are you able to explain the reason for that and uh, uh, that decision? And so the way I see it, the school's going back, right? This is this is why I understand it. This is a, a calculation the government and the scientists have done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're gonna have okay. The transmission is going to be higher if you allow schools to go ahead than if you don't. But it's the indirect impact of not having the schools open that then you got the kids off, which means they're parents that can't work there are yep. parents that uh, their parents that can't work there are so you, you got all that other financial economic social impact of having the schools at home the schools off yeah than than in the school that's how i understand it they've weighed up the pros and cons yes. and go look they're less likely to be killed by it kids are yep. or to have be seriously impacted by it so let's send it to school get the education going yep. let's take the burden off of the economy off of industry the Senate school. Yeah. Is am I understanding that right? Because that's how I that's how I thought I explained it. Yeah. I did say to her, I don't know. I, I don't know, but that's what I think. I, I think you you dead on there, correct. Um the evidence now is 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 gearing towards possibly uh, no face to face contact in universities and, and schools in the future. They'll be looking at the evidence now with the second wave and there might be there might be a change in policy by the government. There may not be, but they, they'll have to look at the numbers strictly every week, uh, every day. To, to But the, the weighing up the stress-related problems of, of, of people being locked, confined to home, mental illness, um, again, economic problems and poverty because mums and dads can't go to work, etc. So it, it, it is a double-edged sword. Um, and... It, the, the maths of of the effective rates will tell if it's the schools that's causing the issue and they might have to, but they may not have to close the schools. I'm not privy to the numbers, mm. but I think you're dead right to what you said. Yeah, because it seems, when you look at it just from an infection control perspective, it is it does seem a contradictory move. Yeah. We need to lock down. Oh, well, let's keep the schools up. Yeah. But again, it's it's sort of like why, you know, why was, why when we were talking earlier about the impact of COVID, is not in terms of health, right? It's not as bad as influenza. But mm -hmm. when you add COVID into the mix of all of the things that cause a strain on the NHS or cause a strain on a healthcare system in any country, yeah. then it, it basically, it's a force multiplier for bad stuff that impacts your body. Yeah. And so there's more deaths and more people because yeah. the cancers don't get treated properly. Yeah. The influenza doesn't get treated very well. The, you name it, X, Y, or Z, disease, flipping virus, illness, anything isn't getting treated properly so everything gets impacted and the death rate goes up right yeah. and uh so yeah i think it's yeah like saying i think it's just, it's just that indirect impacts on uh on home yeah we're, we're not privy to the, to the exact numbers so there will there will be people who are looking at it and making weekly assessments 
Yeah. Right. Um, that's that's me for the questions from from people. Uh, anything? Uh, is there anything you want to come on to that we haven't talked about? Because I'm just conscious that I've led this conversation in terms of topics, and I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't know all the pieces of the puzzle. I, I That's why I invite you on to try and understand all the pieces of the puzzle, because like everyone else, I've been getting really frustrated and struggling to see why we're doing what we're doing. And I think now I'm in a lot better a lot better picture. Um, and I hope people listening or watching are too. And if it sound, if we sound a bit muffled, if we sound a bit muffled during this whole time, we're both wearing face masks. Uh, I, I think doubled up on protection. I think I covered everything. Yeah. Very uh, difficult questions you threw at me there. You answered them very well. <laughs> felt, felt like my PhD viva. <laughs> right, it's uh, no, I really appreciate your time. I do, and you, you're mega busy. Um, also, you are, um, you know, you you putting yourself at risk in doing what you're doing. Um, and I'd like to say thank you for doing what you're doing. It's it's obviously making a difference. It's an important task that's needed, not just for us over here in the UK, but worldwide, right? You, I'm right? Am I right in saying that, you know, everyone around the world, you know, all, all the countries with any sense, you're talking to each other, the scientists, the virologists, everyone's talking to each other to yeah. try and understand how best put this forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, mate. Thank, thank you. you. And um, maybe we'll have to do it again at some point. Hopefully at the end of this. Yeah, at the end, with a beer. Be nice. Yeah. And no mask. <laughs> Ian, cheers, buddy. Stay safe. Thank you.